Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Today, Song Dragons. Quite possibly unique to the world of Toril, they are a rare and elusive form of metallic dragon who, in the draconic form, look a lot like sleek, iridescent silver versions of copper dragons. The bright silver blue scales are quite spectacular on the very rare occasions when these dragons are ever seen in this form. You'll notice I didn't call this their natural form because they prefer to spend the vast majority of their lives in the form of a human female and are for the most intents and purposes a human female. So complete is this transformation into one that even the sage of Shadowdale, the great Elminster, was completely fooled by it. So much so, he actually has a child, Namra Shalas, whose mother, Mirajanthra uh, Shalas, is a song dragon. And I should note that Namra has no idea she is actually a half dragon. She also appears entirely human, although she is possessed of remarkable talents that she has turned toward of life as a somewhat famous rogue in Waterdeep. Song dragons live among humankind, only revealing their true nature in times of absolute peril and great crisis. In human form, they appear to be an attractive woman of 20 to 30 years of age. They are fully aware of who and what they are in either form, but they are consummate actors, so convincing in their ad adoption of the human form that it's almost like they mentally associate with being human which is to say, just reading their surface thoughts magically or psychically will not immediately reveal the ruse, unlike your average polymorphed dragon. They live among humans who have no idea what they actually are, and a good example of this is Alru Crownshield, who worked at the Wormworks shop in Many Cats Lane in Silvery Moon in the year 1372 DR. This is about a year after the shop opened. Let's say your low level adventuring character has passed by and window shopped at the front of the store for a few years, looking at a collection of dragon parts for sale, and the place has a reputation for selling maps from all over the realms, even, some reliable sources say, maps to draconic lairs. One night, your character gets together with an odd assortment of fellow adventurers, probably from some shadowy tavern somewhere, and decides to break in and rob the shop, which they do, seemingly with few problems, cracking a lock on the window on the second floor and sneaking downstairs, opening a padded, uh, padlocked door and swiping a few maps and some dragon teeth, then racing out the back door into the alley to some cheap accommodation where your character can spread out the map over a rough table and peer at it under the light of some tallow candles, slurping some weak and foamy ale. Little do you know, Alru is was up in uh she's up in the room in the inn at the moment of your characters and have followed those characters all the way back from the shop as she always carries a potion of invisibility in a steel flask just in case burglars break in so she can safely track them back to where they stash the shop, shop's property she's not too worried about the dragon teeth they are actually just some drake's uh teeth not actual dragon fangs and the map is one of her dragon map layers expertly crafted and carefully aged to look really authentic the map does lead to a lair, but it's not the lair of a dragon, and it fails to indicate several traps and dire dangers located along the route route it shows uh, across the landscape. While Alru is very fond of the humans Rorik and Delgrath, who um, as retired adventurers set up the shop keepers, uh, as shopkeepers for dragon parts, fancying themselves as experts on the subject of all things dragon, she's actually working to preserve and protect dragons. To that end, she operates by creating erroneous maps to dragon lairs and selling them to merchants and adventurers that would eventually sell them back to Rorik and Delgrath to be resold in the shop. Her maps always lead adventurers on a fruitless, possibly dangerous quest um, or left out important details like traps and warnings. She was content to sweep the floors and attend to customers in the shop, was really quite skilled at pre uh, preparing and preserving bits of dragon to be sold in the shop but whenever she got restless or needed a break from the shop and the old boys she would just go out into a secluded spot transform back into a natural form and sometimes she would actually dive at the, um, the her employers to give them a little scare and something to talk about for a few days once she pretended that she witnessed the theft and investigated when actually she was just strolling around town and listening to gossip watching people go about their lives and browsing shops for the latest fashions and wares. Alru was basically a typical song dragon. For those who live in the world of Toril and truly hate dragons, the purists and xenophobes who fear the world falling back under the control of the draconic races again, 
real incredible threat, song dragons are terrifying. They are the enemy who lives among us. Proof that dragons are everywhere. Anyone could be working for them. Anyone could be one of them. They could have tainted the bloodlines of any family, learned even the most closely guarded secret. More recently in the city of Waterdeep. Now, Waterdeep has a powerful dragon ward over most of the city. Did this get mentioned in the latest source book featuring Waterdeep? Let me know in the uh, comments down below, please. Um, I've yet to get to the latest Waterdeep adventure, and I'd love to know if the dragon ward is still there. I'll give you details on it anyway. In the mid-11th century DR, Ranrasa Shayad returned as a hero from her journeys to Waterdeep atop a mighty copper dragon named Galaderos. Although she was welcomed home, the appearance of her flying mount over the city unsettled the majority of the populace. <laughs> as you'd understand, a large copper dragon flying overhead. Um, Agheron crafted this mythal to ally their fears. So, centred on Agheron's tower, the mythal projected a permanent 12,800 foot radius or 3,900 3, meter dome which encompassed the city as it existed in um, Aghiron's day. In newer areas of Waterdeep, the dragon's water effects are less severe or non-existent, um, which is why um, some draconic-blooded people can exist out on the outskirts. Any creature with draconic blood that tried to enter the city was overcome with an overwhelming urge to leave the area, never to return. However, any draconic creature that touched the dragon staff of Aghiron was able to bypass the dragon ward for as long as the staff's wielder allowed it or until the creature was struck by the staff. Skip forward 300 years and Meryl, the dragon mage, owns the dragon staff of Akeron and dwells in the dragon tower. Now, he's not such a great guy, really. He's quite a villain. In fact, intended to host parties for returning adventurers just so he could quiz them on what monsters they slew and treasures they took and then secretly send out his gargoyle and golem minions to steal any magic items he wanted. A real piece of work. Eventually... The staff was given over to the gold dragon Oranax, uh, but back in 1316 DR, a song dragon named, ooh, bear with me, this is a difficult one, Taron Ramor Lamurla decided to settle in Waterdeep using a human disguise. She convinced Meryl to permit her to live in the city. Over the years, Taron Ramor Lamurla lived many lives in the city, frequently changing her human identity, visiting all the different districts of Waterdeep. In 1339 DR, she finally acquired a stable home in the north ward of Waterdeep, where she used the alias of Tornamorla Esmurla, a scribe from Arm. She worked as a keeper of secrets, safeguarding valued information for her customers, often other dragons hidden in the city. However, soon after, a battle, a big battle, between some of their dragons and the city watch erupted. The fighting escalated to involve the watchful order of magists and the protectors, and even the hidden lords of Waterdeep. However, the lords knew that uh, Tornamorla was a friend and covertly protected her. She simply changed her alias and relocated her lair shortly after. By the early 1370s DR, she had assumed the identity of a deceased uh, Lady Orlavara Draithforl after serving many years as her maid. During the Rage of Dragons in 1373 DR, Taron, uh, Taron Ramor Lamurla was travelling to Silvery Moon when the Rage hit, the Dragon Rage. She was on the verge of destroying some Lurar settlements when Illustrial Silverhand saved her and took her back to Waterdeep. Later, together with Illustrial and Lyral Silverhand, Tarona Ramurla Murla tried to recall all of her fellow hidden dragons back to the city, but met with repeated failure. Two things that really stand out in these two song dragons is their lack of draconic ambition and quite an unusual lack of arrogance. Song dragon males may or may not exist. The offspring of song dragons and humans don't seem to manifest any draconic features at all, not even a draconic bloodline. But I speculate they have some superior traits and may possibly result in a bloodline rich in sorcerers and famous individuals down the track. I don't know where the first strong dragons came from, but it does seem like they have a homeland in the Moonshay Isles. A lot of the lore points back towards the Moonshay Isles where they are concentrated. In draconic form, they share similar traits to copper dragons. Physically, they are a little bit weaker, not quite as strong and robust, but with a greater degree of innate magical power. An adult song dragon can cast Blink, Featherfall, Light, Tongues, True Seeing, and Darkness at will. 
Once per day, they can cast Shape Change. That's a ninth level spell. Teleport. They're all um, immune to electricity and poison. Plus, they can probably cast Aura of Purity. I would include that as an adaptation for 5th edition play. Song Dragons strike quickly and mercilessly with a razor sharp claws and tend to sing joyously as they fight, although they remain silent if the noise would endanger their allies or the success of their own attack. In human form, Song Dragons prefer to fight using slashing edged weapons, if they must fight at all, and when they do, they sing. There are many instances where Song Dragons make heavy use of their allies and associates to do the fighting for them, which is great for self-preservation, but more so it helps to to conceal their true nature for as long as possible. The Draconic Breath Weapon is a 60 foot cone of electrically charged gas. Difficulty class 18 dexterity saving throw, taking 66 cold damage and 66 lightning damage on a failed save. Half as much damage on a successful one. Unlike many metallic dragons, they only have the one form of breath attack. Their ability to exist in an alternate form is supreme. They can freely use this power to assume human, uh, a human form. They always appear as human females, and each dragon, song dragon has a unique human form that it assumes each time it changes shape. The Song Dragon's Strength, Dexterity and Constitution scores become Human Average, Strength 10, Dexterity 11, Constitution 10, but its hit points are equal to an adult Copper Dragon. They can't manifest Dragon Fear in their human form, same as any other dragon. Some more examples of known Song Dragons include uh, Karasen Driath, who was a female adult Song Dragon who lived in Impulter around 1374 DR and the lover of Dawn Greybrook. She participated in the effort to rid Faerun of Samasta's Rage of Dragons during 1373 DR. Her human form, Kara, was a beautiful, willowy, silver-haired woman. Esembra Meritha was a song dragon who was known to non-dragons as the legendary adventurous Esembra, who had red hair and red eyes, for whom the town in Battledale was named. Born in 961 DR in the Daylands, she had uh, she led a remarkable life in what were, at the time, lawless lands. She carved out a legendary reputation through numerous adventures and well-known deeds, such as when she spurned an elf lord's advances, wrestled and choked to death a dwarf king with her bare hands, and many other great tales. Her death is, well, was, was quite a mystery, actually. She vanished without a trace one day, along with her husband, and it's long been a source of speculation in the Dales. The truth is, she just retired and went to live in Evermeet. Her granddaughter, Anway Maven, founded the Sisterhood of Sembra. If you have a player wanting to play a character with a draconic bloodline for their sorcery powers, or perhaps their bardic inspirations, and the character happens to have a very high charisma, happens to sing when they fight, it could be fun to include a legacy connection to a song dragon heritage, and leave the door open to getting deeply involved in the most mysterious, secretive and lesser known dragon society, operating concealed in plain sight, working quietly and carefully to preserve and protect dragonkind, while at the same time, deeply appreciating what it is to be human and fighting to preserve their assumed cultural identity as well. Very interesting creatures. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.